Anyway, we're just so excited about weather changing. We have to go through this, but it's, you know, we're on the, we're doing fine, and I hope you are doing fine. We are continuing our study in Revelation, and I'm going to assume that everybody read chapter 12 before you came in to class this morning. So if you'll get out a pencil, a piece of paper, and no. <laughs> uh, so glad you're here. Before we get started, are there any special prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Audrey Baird. Yeah, she she passed away yesterday. We need to remember her family. Yes, ma'am. Ray. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Julie Stafford in isolation. Yeah, in isolation. All right, we'll definitely remember Julie in our prayers. Okay. Well, if you will, yes, ma'am. Her name again? June. And she's what now? Health issues. Okay. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our God and Father, we are so grateful to you for all you have done for us. And Father, to come to you and ask for more at times seems like we are selfish. But Father, you have asked us. You have asked us to come and ask you. And so Father, we are. And we believe, Father, you hear us and you answer us. And Father, this morning in a very special way, we want to bring these four people to your attention. First of all, Father, uh, we, we want to bring the family of, uh, 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 of uh, Audrey. We ask you, Father, to be with them at this time. And Father, we pray that you will be with us. Uh, be with those who are attending that family. We ask, Father, that you be with Ray, who is suffering from pneumonia. Father, we ask you to be with Julie, who is in isolation at this time. And, Father, we ask you to touch her in a very special way. And, Father, we, we ask you to be with June and the health issues that she is dealing with. And, Father, it is our prayer that you will lift these up that are suffering health issues you will touch them and comfort them and be with their families. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity and this freedom we have to come together and study your word. Help us, Father, to be conformed more and more into the image of your Son because of our study of your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We are in the 12th chapter of Revelation, and I hope that you did read the chapter uh, someone said it's beginning to sound like in every chapter we keep coming back to the same point. And if that's what you're discovering, then you're understanding Revelation. Because Revelation was written to a church that uh, was under intense persecution. Now there's something about the church we're going to learn in just a few moments the congregations that Paul or, or that John is writing to, if you will remember, the twelve or the uh, excuse me, the seven congregations are in Turkey. That means they're mostly Gentile, and because they're mostly Gentile, these Gentiles have come out of a pagan society that said, you pay tribute to your God so you will have health, wealth, and comfort. Now keep that in mind. 
because they have come out of a pagan religion system. It says, if you do the right things for your gods, your gods are going to do right things by you. And now all of a sudden, these newly converted Christians, mostly who are Gentile, are experiencing the opposite. They're not experiencing all of the things that their supposed false gods promised. And so I want to begin by telling you something. Several years ago, Sandra and I were traveling in our car and we were listening to a radio preacher. And he made a reference about how politically incorrect America has become, especially how politically incorrect it is to pray in the name of Jesus at public events. He said that he had been asked to speak at a public event and he was warned that he could not refer to Jesus in prayer but he could refer to Buddhism, Muslims, and Hindus. Those were not off limits. He were told that he could not pray into the name of the Son of God and the reason is because it seems like the name of Jesus is the only one that's become politically incorrect in America. Now the question is, why is that? Why is it that the one and true and only Son of God of the whole universe has become politically incorrect and has been singled out to be the most offensive of all world religions? Why is that? Well, this is exactly probably what the early church was wondering. Especially considering that these congregations were in Turkey. They had come out, most of the members of the congregations had come out of pagan religions. And because of their stand that Jesus is Lord, guess what's happening to them? They too have become politically incorrect. Brothers and sisters in Christ, being politically incorrect when it comes to wearing the name of Christ is nothing new. As Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. Now why is the name of Christ become so politically incorrect, especially uh, during the times of Rome when religion was only two to three hundred years old uh, before it became corrupted, it still was one of the most persecuted religions in the world. Well, part of the problem was if you didn't say Caesar was Lord, uh, you were really becoming politically incorrect against Rome itself. So the question would be, and I think it's the question that the early church would be asking, especially those seven congregations that are experiencing so much persecution. Why was Jesus, and naming and claiming Jesus as the only Lord and Savior, why did that become such a big deal in Rome? Why did Rome single out Christians? Why did he become so politically incorrect? Well, that is the question Revelation is answering. That is what the book of Revelation is answering. And the real reason for this portion of Revelation in chapter 12 is to get us to understand the genesis of all evil, the beginning of evil, and what Satan is trying to do. And chapter 12 is a pivotal point in the book of Revelation, because up until this time, what has Christ done? He's pulled back the curtain, and he's let the early church see through the writing of John what's going on, who's still on the throne, who's behind it, and why. But when we come to the 12th chapter, we see the conflict painted in a very, very uh, real way. And the conflict focuses not on 
Christ, or, or not on Satan and the church, but between Satan and Jesus. There is where the conflict actually began. And so what Revelation 12 is, it gives us a glimpse behind the scene. And what this chapter does is it introduces the enemies uh, of God and Jesus. Brethren, here's the point. Revelation 12 is telling us this is not a new battle. This is a cosmic battle. It is Satan who has has been and is presently and will in the future be the one behind all the evil on the face of this earth, especially against the church. Satan is the evil one. And from this chapter on, what we're going to do is we're going to see some answers that those early Christians may have been asking. Questions such as, why are we being treated like this? What have we done wrong? Why are we enemies of the state? Why are they picking on us? Why does Rome hate us so much? These questions are going to be answered. And really, if it was happening today, well, it is happening today to some degree, isn't it? Have you ever asked those questions? What has the church done against the government of the United States to be singled out that we can't pray in public, we can't do certain things, and we're, they're starting to little by little take away some of our freedoms. Why is that? Well, when you have the answer, it makes total sense. And you begin to understand. And so what this does is it shows us from the beginning. It is Satan who is behind all of this. Secondly, this chapter introduces the reality that Rome was simply a tool of Satan do not forget that point. For the Western mindset, we struggle with this one. Now what we have to remember, the Bible was written to Eastern mindset. We're Western mindset. We think differently. And because of that, Excuse me. <clears throat> we understand what is behind the high moral, ethical, and reasons for the establishment of America. America was based on and started on some very biblical sound principles. Now I want to ask you a question. What was the fruit of that? The fruit of it was, when a nation is founded upon biblical principles, what does God do? He blesses that nation. I believe that Satan allowed the experiment to start. He didn't like where it went. Where was the roots of the restoration movement? Where did the restoration movement to restore that which had been lost for centuries? Where did it really take root in America? It was a restoration to get back to the Bible, to get back to the way church is supposed to be, get back to God's word. And it went all over the land and it spread like wildfire. And I think because of that, this land experienced the promise of God in 2 Chronicles 7, 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among the people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Is that a promise from God just only to a certain people? That's a promise from God to all people. But it's conditional. Many of us grew up in a land with such a government. But what happened? 
The temptation was to go from worshiping God to worshiping the government. Believing God into believing in government. And that is when Satan finds his opening. He gets a foothold in the government. He takes over. And who do you suppose he's going to put in his crosshairs? Any people who honor God. He sneaks in and he begins to take over the ruling class so he can use them. And that's the key word. So he can use them for his agenda. This is what Revelation 12 is about. Now, let's look at the clarification of the scene of Revelation 12. In verses 1 and 2, if you have your Bibles... Read with me. I don't have it on PowerPoint. Here's what it says. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and called out in pain. She was about to give birth. Now, who is this woman? According to the early church, this woman represents God's people. Now, before Jesus was born, who was God's people? The Hebrews, exactly. What does the number 12 stand for? She has, 12, she has these 12 stars and a crown of victory on her head. 12 is victory. 12 is completeness. The completeness, if you will, of God's people. The number 12 is 10 plus 2, remember. 10 is 100% of God's will being done to people. God's 100% will being done for his people. Who is this woman that she is about to give birth to? She's about to give birth. Jesus came from who? What nation? You said it a while ago. The Hebrews. Jesus came from the Hebrews. He was a Jew. She's about to give birth. And she's going to give birth. And the people under the law. The people who are under the law before Christ was born and after Christ was born for a few years is the expectant mother. In Micah 4 verses 9 and 10 we read, Why do you now cry aloud? Have you no king? Has your ruler perished? That pain seizes you like a woman in labor, writhe in angry daughter Zion like a woman in labor? For now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon there to be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hand of your enemies. The woman in pain is Hebrews. It's the Hebrew nation. She's going to give birth to the Savior. Jesus was born of the Jews. Now let's read verses 3 through 9. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God, to his throne. The woman fled to the desert, to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of, 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. 
he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. The dragon is the devil. Now think about this scene. Israel, Hebrews, there is a baby coming from the Hebrews. He is born and waiting for him to devour him is who? Satan. Does that story sound familiar? Do y'all remember why Jesus, when he was born, why Joseph had to take Jesus to Egypt? Do you remember why? What was Satan trying to do? Stop God's plan. And now God's people go into hiding. We're going to look at that in just a moment. This is where we discover that Satan is the dragon and also the evil one called the devil. And notice verse 9. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. This is the first time uh, he is referred to as a serpent since Genesis chapter 3. Now the only time we find out that he is the devil and Satan and also discover something, he is to lead the whole world from God. That is his mission. He symbolizes all that is wicked, all that is destructive, and all that is rebellious towards God. This is what he represents. He has ten horns. Ten meaning all powerful. He is powerful. He has seven crowns. He has authority and he's difficult to destroy. That's what those numbers meant to the early church. And in chapter 16 verse 13 of Revelation, we're going to learn that he has only one mouth. But his crowns are not crowns of victory. They are temporary crowns. They are limited in power. And they are confined only to this world. Did you notice that? He has been cast down to this world. And we also find that he is standing before the woman who was about to give birth. So he could destroy the child. He didn't get away with it. Now who is more helpless than a mother And her child, when that child is about to be born, that's when Satan tried to strike and it didn't work. And then that means the child then is Jesus. He was born of a woman from the Hebrews. Satan tried to destroy him. You see what John has just seen? He has seen in a very, very familiar way the story of Jesus. And Satan trying to destroy him. Now why, has, why does the church need to hear this? What did Jesus say? If you follow me, they're going to do to you what they did to the prophets. And they're going to do to you what they're going to do to me. And who's behind it? Satan. Now the average person would look at this scene and say, that the woman and the child had no chance of survival. It looks like the outcome is foregone and the woman is going to lose, the child is going to lose. But now I want you to think for a moment. What was going on when Jesus was born? Did Satan try to prevent a woman, Israel, from producing a Messiah? Yeah, he did. He tried it in the Old Testament by leading and deceiving God's people at every turn. If you read the Old Testament, you're going to see every time, it seems like at every turn, Satan's there trying to stop them. So when when it came time for Jesus to be born, Satan tried to destroy him. All male babies, two years of age and under, were being killed when Jesus was born. That's why Joseph had to take him to Egypt. And Satan failed at his attempt to stop Jesus. He deceived the nation of Israel, however, to crucify Jesus, didn't he? Now, I want you to think about this scene. 
He tried to destroy Jesus at his birth. He failed. So he goes to work for the next 30-something years, and he finally convinces Israel to crucify Jesus. Now this is where the wisdom of God steps in. God gave Satan just enough rope for Satan to hang himself because from the very beginning, what was God's plan? That Jesus was going to die, not at birth, but at the cross. And when Jesus died, Satan and all his angels were probably, they were probably celebrating. That was on Friday. What they did not know is Sunday's coming. And when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, one of the things happened. And that is Satan was once and for all and forever defeated. And there is nothing he can do to undo what Jesus did for us at the cross. Nothing. And the church had to hear this. He's coming after you. He's going to do everything he can to destroy you. He's going to use government against you. He's going to use all kinds of things against you. Just remember, he's been defeated and he cannot kill you. Well, wait a minute. Weren't those people dying? Their bodies were. But they weren't. And they needed to hear this. Phaeton has failed at every attempt. And now with Jesus in heaven, what does it say happened? He took his wrath and his anger out against the Son of God. And it backfired on him. So where does he turn now? Where does his anger turn? What does it turn towards? It now turns towards the new Israel, the woman, the church. And that's exactly what Revelation 12 says. He turns now against the woman. And even so, God protects her. Don't forget this principle. Because if we forget this principle, we forget our place in the kingdom of God. We are the new Israel, we are the Jews. And since the child, Jesus, had escaped the, the Satan's trap and his grasp, what does Satan do? He turns, he turns his attention to the woman. Remember, the Israel of the Old Testament was fleshly Israel. But after the ascension of Jesus, who becomes Israel? We do. You're baptized into Christ Jesus. You become the promised The reception of the promise. And the early church had no problem understanding the continuity between the old Israel and the church. It's all through their writings in the early church you understand this. But that continuity, if you will, has been broken by the introduction of misunderstanding and misapplication of revelation. And that concept came about in something called premillennialism that reared its ugly head in the 17th century. Let me tell you what premillennialism is. You've probably heard it, maybe not recognize the name. Premillennialism is the teaching that when Christ returns, uh, there's going to be a thousand year kingdom. Let me tell you something, that's not what Revelation 20 is teaching. That was interpreted that way in the 17th century by a Catholic priest who was told to write that to separate Jesus from the kingdom of God and the church from the kingdom of God. And he did a marvelous thing in doing that and he took Matthew 24 and made it say something it never said and I'm telling you more than you probably want to know but the bottom line is, brethren, if you believe in premillennialism, Here's what's going to happen. You're going to dethrone Jesus. Because the doctrine of premillennialism says Jesus is not yet on the throne and the church was nothing more than an emergency gap until Christ could come back and complete what he started. Now, folks, 
I thought Jesus said at the cross, it is finished. That means there's nothing else to do here. He completed his will. Now, if you want to study more about that, I'll be happy to do that. Time in this class just doesn't do that. But let me tell you, rest assured, the early church did not understand it that way. It wasn't until the 17th century that a priest in the Catholic Church said that's what it meant. And the whole purpose was people began to re read Revelation in the 17th and 18th century, and they began leaving Catholic Church. Why? They began to understand what Revelation was saying, and Catholic Church sure was fitting what Rome was doing. And people were leaving the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church says, we got to stop this bleeding, and in order to do it, we will, read, we will redefine what Revelation is actually saying. Now, this brings us up to demonstrate just how successful Satan has been in deceiving people who are trying or who think or proclaiming to follow Jesus. These people have been deceived about Israel. They have been deceived about the church. They have been deceived about the lordship of Jesus. They have dethroned him, whether they realize it or not. And I'm talking about those who preach and teach premillennialism. But Jesus of Revelation is not the same Jesus of premillennialism. And if you don't think it makes any difference of what kind of Jesus you need to believe in, read 1 John. That's what the whole book of 1 John is about. The Gnostics believed in a Jesus, but it wasn't the Jesus. So it not only matters about believing in Jesus, we must believe the right Jesus. And I want you to note this, what God has done for the new Israel, the church, what does he do? It says he protects her for 42 months. Now remember, what is the 42 months? Remember last week, it's just a short time. And compared to eternity, we're just here for a short time, aren't we? And so while we're here on this earth during this short time, who is going to protect us? God has promised he will. Satan stands for against everything God wants. But God is still going to provide protection for his church. He will give us everything we need to accomplish his will. But one thing he will not do is give us everything we want. He will give us everything we need. And part of what we need is a faith that will sustain when the government comes after us, when Satan comes after us with his most powerful tools. And so we read in James 4, 7, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Now, what is the first thing we have to do before Satan flees? He says, first of all, submit. Submit to who? To God. And I think one of the reasons Satan sometimes is so effective in his deception is because we don't fully submit. We want to do God's will our way. Well, God says you got to do it my way. That means i got to submit to what God wants and how he wants it. And so when we submit, then, then we can resist and then he will flee. Now, does it mean he becomes less powerful? No. I want you to notice the song after Satan loses his battle against God in chapter 10, or in chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God in day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He, has, he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. That's talking what's taking place during the 42 month period. 
very short time. Why is he so intent on destroying? He knows his time is short. So what does he do? Verse 15, he lies. He deceives. He continues to make war against two. Verse 17, the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commandments and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Who's that describing? The Jews or the church? The church who are the spiritual Jews. So therefore, here's what Revelation 12 in this pivotal point now in this book is saying. We must remember, and the early church had to remember, Satan has been defeated. He has been cast down, brethren. The onslaught of Satan against Jesus as he deceived and manipulated the Jews and the Romans to kill Jesus backfired on him. At the cross, Satan probably thought he had won. But the worst he could do against God was his undoing of himself. Now he may have won the verdict in Pilate's court, but brethren, the resurrection reversed the decision. Secondly, Satan's defeat does not mean he has given up. Don't ever forget that. His loss does not mean he is now inactive. It means that we fight a battle from the standpoint of victory that's already been won. Brethren, we, listen carefully, we don't be church so we can go to heaven. We are the church because we're on our way to heaven. Never forget that. Never forget that. And on this trip in the church, as we go through this world, we're going to be having to fight these small battles here and there. But remember, he deceives the whole world, which can at times be very demoralizing for those who are in the kingdom of God. But the sad part is that when we look at all the things going on in this world, and not through God's perspective, we lose God's perspective and begin to believe the lie that he's winning. He has already been defeated. And that is how he has been so successful because I believe that he has become, he has convinced so many people that he's a myth. If he can just convince people he doesn't even exist, he's got them. And the warning of this chapter is, don't underestimate the enemy. It is very easy for him to deceive those who are in the dark and for those who love the darkness. That's who's being deceived today, brethren. When you look out onto this world and you see all the evil that people are involved in and all the evils going on, brethren, all you're seeing is people who have fallen for the lie. And I believe that's why Paul said in Romans 8, 1, 31, 33, 34. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that who raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Brethren, don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. Where is Jesus, the right hand of God? What's he doing? Interceding for us. Why is he doing that? Because we're right now living in the world that Satan is using, trying to destroy us. And I believe where he is focused is on the church. You see, Satan's not focused on those he already has. He's focusing on using those he already has to destroy those who are not yet his. Don't forget that. And so don't ever forget that our source of victory is the blood of the Lamb. Not only was Calvary Satan's death blow, brethren, Calvary is our life flow. The early church and the church today does not win 
Brethren, listen to me carefully. We do not win today because of the superiority of our numbers. We do not win today because of our wealth or our social standing. We do not win today because of our vast influence. We win today because of what Jesus did at the cross. Never forget that. Don't forget it at the funeral home. Don't forget it when you see all the evil. Don't forget it. We win because of what Jesus did. And it's based on the blood of the Lamb, brethren. That's why we keep the commandments of God. And that's why we keep the commandments of God even if they kill us. After all, keep in mind, all will die. And this is why Satan is so angry and so determined in destroying us. But he can't destroy us as long as we're in the light. Well, Jack, he can crucify us. Sure he can. That just destroys the body. Remember what Jesus said? Don't fear the one that can destroy the body. You fear the one who destroys both the body and soul in Gehenna. That's the one you fear. You fear God. And let the world go ahead and parade around in their deception, thinking that they know more than God, that they are wiser than the creator of the universe. Let them go ahead and do that. We will try to tell them otherwise if they will listen. But if they don't, let them wield their supposedly power over others. Let them think to themselves that they are the wisest of all. Let them think that they know more about Jesus than what Jesus himself revealed to us. What they don't know is they are puppets of Satan. And their eternity is in a lake of fire. You see, their power is only temporary and pseudo. So in Revelation 22, 1 through 5, we read, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as a clearest crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the fruit are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and the servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will be no need of light for a lamp or light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Don't forget that last sentence. Don't forget that. You see, when you keep that in mind and keep it in perspective, this war started when Satan challenged God and God answered the challenge with Christ. And now he's left the church on this earth to show the wisdom of God. Don't forget our mission. It's not to save our skin. It's to preach the gospel and honor God with our lives. Because brethren, we have a home where Satan will no longer exist. It's called heaven. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you for dealing with my sinuses. Love you guys. Thank you.